Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good whatever time of day it is. Thank you for tuning in to Conversations with Dr. Don. And for your first time viewers, Conversations with Dr. Don is an ongoing series of one hour standalone talk shows where I interview interesting people like most of you out there about who they are as unique, one of a kind of individuals, and about whatever it is that we have decided to talk about. And tonight we're going to be talking about the Portland Harbor Community Advisory Group's activities in regards to... Portland Harbor Superfund. Yeah, Portland Harbor Superfund. Portland Harbor Superfund. Perfect. I had my notes all organized. <laughs> <laughs> it's my fault. <laughs> and as you all know, I'm Dr. Don, and I'm feeling a little nervous because I'm, usually I have one guest, sometimes two, but rarely three guests at the same time. And the subject we'll be addressing is so complex, and there's so much involved here, and so I'm just kind of nervous that I'm going to goof up, which I never do. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Jim, introduce yourself, please. Okay, I'm Jim Robinson. I'm chair of the Portland Harbor Community Advisory Group. Yeah, I'm a resident of North Portland, been involved in watching the Superfund cleanup process as it's progressed over the last 14 years. How are you feeling right this minute? <sighs> oh, well, okay. uh, it's taken a long time. Long haul. But there's a lot to it. It's very complicated and I, I, we want to be sure it's done right. Are you feeling nervous right now? Not really. Well, okay. that's terrible. I'm nervous and you're not. You make me feel comfortable. <laughs> yeah, you do. Yes, you do. And who are you, beautiful lady? I'm Jackie Calder, yes. and I have lived in Portland and Oregon almost all my life. And I love growing up here, and I love the rivers, and I have yeah. swam, canued, sailed. Ran ski boats yeah, on native, the huh? oh yeah the yeah. Oregon rivers and just adore them just love them. How do you feel right now? Pretty good, pretty but good. But you're not nervous either. Not too bad, no. I'm leaving. I'm the only one nervous here. <laughs> no, I, I know not. I know the right answer to say yes, I am nervous. And you are, <laughs> and you are Faduma, yes, who um, are in just a few words for now. Okay, yeah. My name is Faduma, and I am the Portland Harbor Community Organizer for Groundwork Portland. I mm -hmm. lived in Oregon for about 14 years. I'm originally from Somalia. So my interest yeah. Isn't that beautiful? Yeah. yeah. So, and awesome. how are you feeling right now? I mean, I'm great. I'm, it's good to finally I'm meet you. But I'm, <laughs> it's good to finally meet you, and, and you make us not nervous, so that's a good thing. Yeah. That's why we have you here. And uh, as you know, the show goes in about two major segments. The first segment is the bio segment, and who are you, and any boyfriends or wives or husbands or that sort of a thing. And then we go to the second half of the show, which may be 30 minutes, 35, 25 minutes, depends on how much time we take in talking about who you are. A uh, few words about myself. I was born in New Orleans, Louisiana in 1928. I'm an old, older man. <laughs> and I dropped out of junior high school because I didn't like school and I was a, for other reasons. And finally went back to school after many, many years and got my doctorate in clinical psychology, became a clinical psychologist and did a lot of things along the way. And I'm the baby of 12 children. Oh. And mm. uh, there's so much more I can tell you about that, but that's another story for now. I'm interested in who you are. Shall we take you first, put you on the hot seat? Okay. I, I can say I grew up in, near Issaquah, Washington, which is a a little bit east of Seattle, mm -hmm. uh, the youngest of seven children, and then I have another brother younger than me, half brother, and so there's eight of us all together. And I attended college at Willamette University, got my master's degree from the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard. Oh wow! And then mm -hmm. came to Portland, started working here. I actually originally moved into Portland because I had a job working with Thousand Friends of Oregon. And then I've moved on to a number of other projects and a number of other jobs working with political organizations. And right now I run a small business doing political consulting. You're a dying of the world leftist, aren't you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let me ask you some specific questions, okay? Sure. Hey, and you said uh, where you were born. And I always have a trick question for each of my guests, and I can ask it uh, mm -hmm. anytime, and I'm surprised you with it. Uh, 
And when were you born? Did you show me when? What year? 1964. 64, okay. Why were you born? Why? Hmm. My guests always say, why? <laughs> <laughs> That's my trick question. I guess, why? Yes, why were you born? Your parents decided. That's okay. Because my parents decided that there would be one more of us. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm more interested in your reaction to the question than the actual answer, you know? <laughs> but I'll tell you one thing about all of us growing up in a, a family with seven of us all growing up together, we are amazed that we're all still alive. Okay, and I'm the last wow. one of the 12 of us. I'm the last of the Mohicans. Mm -hmm. Wow. It's a difference between us. Anyhow, uh, anything significant about your racial, national, or cultural heritage that's worth telling the viewers about? Or are you just playing with American white bread? Well, I've done a lot of genealogy research and found Ooh. where all the different avenues come from. There's, on my mom's side, it's fairly simple. My grandpa was born in Germany. My grandma was born in Hungary. And so on that branch of the family, there's German, Hungarian, Bohemian, and then maybe a few others mixed in. On my dad's side of the family, the most recent immigrants to the U.S. were probably in, sometime in the 1700s. Mm -hmm. But the, it's mostly Scottish, then German, as well as English, mm -hmm. some various others, some Cheyenne, Cherokee, Iroquois, perhaps. Not quite certain about all those. The Sh Cherokee, we've I've figured out where the line is, but not quite certain where the others, if if it all matches up properly. I'm glad you said that quite certain, because now and then <laughs> I'll have a guest and they say, I'm this, this, and this, and this, and they look me in the eye as though there never was a wood pile or something. <laughs> <laughs> Enough of <laughs> <laughs> Can you mention anything about your religious preference that you have had or had or have now? Or do you want to comment about a religious preference? I'm just, I believe in individuals. Okay. <laughs> you have no organized religion that you support? No. Okay, good. Oh, my God. Uh, and you mentioned your education. And what do you do now to feed yourself by way of earning a living? I'm consulting with political candidates. Uh, also consulting with nonprofits and small business, but the bulk of it is with political candidates. And that gives you a few helping nickels. them get elected. It gives you a few, enough uh, money to live on. Mm -hmm. Oh boy. Yeah. Okay. Most of the time. <laughs> 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 so, yeah. And do you have a partner, a boyfriend, girlfriend, wife, or husband, or anything? Like that? Well, there's, there's my partner in the business and partner in life. So, yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, have any children? No. Yeah, and Although I will mention, my mom has 31 great-grandchildren. Wow. <laughs> oh my gosh. That's a, you know, do you know them all? I'm sure there's one I haven't met. <laughs> uh, I don't know, wait, maybe it's 32. <laughs> it's either 31 or 32. Don't Great start me on that track because I'm <laughs> very old and I can give I, I lost track birthdays. years ago. <laughs> and how, are you, how would you characterize yourself on the political continuum, left, right, or center, or are you a tea party or what? Uh, left. <laughs> yeah. anyway. I'll say progressive. There are, I will work for progressive candidates. So generally, that's always Democrats. Often, it will be someone who's not a Democrat, but maybe Labor Party or Working Family or something like that, mm -hmm. Independent, Green. I haven't found a Republican yet that would fit the bill. So. <laughs> hey, I keep looking. <laughs> the countdown clock isn't working out here, Mr. E, Mr. Director. And uh, memberships in political, social, or civic organizations, any memberships that you hold that would be of interest to the viewers. I'm an ACLU member and public citizen, common okay. cause, and a whole bunch of those. those yeah, I'm a, mm -hmm. I'm a Democratic Precinct Committee person. I am a board member of the health of Healthcare for All Oregon. Yeah, working for single payer healthcare or for universal healthcare for everyone. Mm -hmm. and I am. Pardon. I am in Toastmasters. I am president of Portland Progressives Toastmasters and a member of Portland Toastmasters. 
Oh, we're going to talk some more about that later on. Yeah. <laughs> and persons from the past or alive today that you uh, admire or admired or particularly look up to. Any names come to mind for you? Well, one that really comes to mind all the time would be Robert Kennedy, Bobby Kennedy. Why? Because I think this would have been an entirely different country if he had lived and been elected president of the United States. Absolutely. I'm noticing all these nodding heads, including yep. my own. Yeah. 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 So shall we move on to another guest and sure. see if we can probe their inner workings? <laughs> you ready? Hi. Yeah, I suppose. So when and where were you born? I'm I not supposed to ask a woman when. Forget about that it's part. It's okay. I was <laughs> born in 1946. I don't care. Um, I was born in Hawthorne, Nevada, and that's because my father was in the Navy, and he was stationed there. And the reason I was born, if you want to know why, <laughs> is because my mother was just crazy about him. <laughs> she was just nuts. <laughs> Hawthorne, Nevada is near Lake Walker, which is gorgeous. It's about halfway between Reno and Las Vegas. And other than that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And anything significant about your cultural uh, heritage, anything at all? Um, well, my granddaughter and I have been working on our genealogy at, recently, and we found, I think, my sixth great grandmother, no, grandfather, Moses. And, but the most interesting one is the one, uh, and that's on the mother's side, on Alma B. Nutter's side. But the most interesting one was Henry B. Nutter because his parents' birth records aren't registered because his father and mother were Iroquois and they didn't register uh, them. Yeah. So there there isn't any any records of them. I'm sure I can go back to Vermont and maybe find some kind of mention, but I know that my great grandparents always talked about Chief Nutter and the reason they called him that was cuz they gathered the nuts. <laughs> now we can uh, I didn't mention my racial heritage if there's such a thing as red, white and black. <laughs> and we can trace back all the nice European white stuff. And we can't tell what part of black Africa that my forebears came from. I call it about a third, a third, and a third. Mm -hmm. And of course, you didn't own the, the red heritage, American Indian, because it wasn't fashionable to do that in those days. Mm -hmm. No. My grandmother claimed uh, English, English, English. And there are a lot of nutters that are English. Mm -hmm. That isn't where my nutter came <laughs> from. <laughs> a religious preference for you. Can you talk about that I, at all or not? Yes. Um, I am Christian. I was raised um, Lutheran, um, belong to non-denominational uh, things like Young Life growing up, and went to Malibu in Canada. And I have a pretty deep-seated faith in um, God. Mm -hmm. It's it's always been a part of me. I don't think it'll ever yeah. go away. And that serves you well. Yeah. That's what counts. Yeah. It feels good in the heart. Yeah. And your formal education? Um, I went to high school here, although I bounced a little bit, uh, in Portland. Um, but I went to you can laugh, Boise State University, which is a wonderful university. Mm -hmm. I went to the University of Oregon. I went to Portland State and finally graduated <laughs> in, in science because I loved um, the environmental um, part. But I also graduated in um, um, community organization and change because that's really what I'm about is is getting people involved, participating in their community. Why are you about that? Why is it? What is it about you that you're about that? Well, I, you know, I, I, like I say, I love the rivers of Oregon, and I love the how beautiful Oregon is. I, I lived with my great grandparents for a while and love the woods. There's something deep seated in me. My sister's very citified. My mother is too, but. I had this countryfied feeling from a small child, and that never left me. I love the woods, I love the forest, I love the rivers, that kind of thing. And it's always been with me, and 
probably always will. You ever wrote poetry? Some, yeah. I'll bet, I'll bet you write beautifully <laughs> by your expression and what happens to your eyes when you talk about those things that you love. It mm. shows. <laughs> <laughs> poetry is beautiful. Yeah. And what do you do for a living nowadays? I'm. I take care of um, my nine-year-old grandchild, who is pretty adorable, <laughs> but uh, she speaks Spanish just <laughs> faster than I can possibly think, <laughs> and she's very precious to me, and we have a pretty good time together. Does she like grandma? Kind of, sort of. She says, she said to me the other day, we were going out to look at her great-grandparents' grave. We drove to um, state in Oregon, and she said, you know, Grandma, you actually raised me, because my daughter works, she's a pharmacist, and she says, but Grandma, you really raised me. I really know more things from you than anybody. At nine years old, she's saying At nine this years you. old, I was, <laughs> it brought me to tears. I just thought, oh my gosh, oh, I had no idea. Yeah. Uh, you have a partner, um, husband, wife, girlfriend? No, boyfriend. I kind of failed on that end. I've been married twice, and yeah. phew, although <laughs> the truth is, I still live with my ex-husband. We're just friends. Yeah. And sometimes we argue and fight just like we did when we were married, which is why <laughs> we're not. <laughs> so why be married? All right. Uh, your political persuasion. Are it's, you as far left as Jim here? Oh, pretty much, yeah. <laughs> pretty faithfully so. Yeah. Yep, and I'm with him. The Kennedys, I, I, I've just always admired them. And I grew up sitting on the sofa with my mother watching um, uh, President John Kennedy's um, uh, press conferences and just thought, wow, how fabulous and can remember many of them and all the things he said and they were just very meaningful to me when I even when I was in high school. Yeah. See, you're making me get all soft and mushy inside. And kind of Shall we move over here to the uh, friend from Somalia? Yeah, she, she's going to be really interesting. <laughs> yeah, she ready for me? Yeah, I yeah. think so. <laughs> Last one. Are you nervous now at all? You know, not really. A little bit, maybe. I think. Do you want an answer? Yes. <laughs> exactly. And yeah. when and where were you born? I was born in Somalia. Uh -huh. um, I consider myself global citizen because I actually traveled to different countries when I was growing up. But my I was born in Somalia. My family immigrated, walked to Kenya, lived in um, the Dabra refugee camp as an immigrant because the war started in 1990. And uh, from there, we left to Saudi Arabia. And from Saudi Arabia, we went to Egypt. And from Egypt, we came to Oregon. So, yeah, long journey. <laughs> <laughs> wow. How many years were you bouncing around Africa? Um, I. I for until I was like tw 11. 11. Mm -hmm. Do you have any memories of those places and what happened to you in those places? You know, it's um, it's one of those things that I look back and I am grateful in a lot of ways that those are the, some of the challenges. It, there's a lot of challenges, obviously, living in a refugee camp, one of them being environmental issues. And that's where my passion actually came came out from, like going to school and learning about environmental issues is that uh, living in Dabdab refugee camp for a little bit, it, it kind of sh tells you the, some of the things that we need, like water and and and, and um, you know uh, daily things that we use that are not available to us. So you look into things more carefully and, and appreciate the environment a lot more. Because you experience yeah. things more personally than Definitely, yeah. the average American who was born and yeah. raised here. But you know, it's 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 um I, I don't never let my past determine my future and I always see that as an opportunity to raise awareness and then educate and, and encourage people to, to like go on. And you're doing that nowadays? Yeah, with with my work at school and that I gra graduated from Portland State and um, um, and the current job I'm working on, the project that I'm doing, all kind of relates to my passion for like raising people's voices. Are you a tree hugger? 
<laughs> yes, I, although I didn't know what a tree hug really meant. <laughs> and so, I am. Yes, I am actually. My parents and my family always make fun of me because I would tell them, don't litter, take that, put it in the garbage. <laughs> but I really didn't know what tree hugging was until I, I there's this protest in my, one of my environmental science classes that they were going to, like, um, for trees that they were cutting down, and people actually climb up the tree and hug the tree so they don't cut them. Mm -hmm. So I was like, oh, that's what it means to be a tree hugger. So I yeah. consider myself an environmentalist. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you mentioned your cultural heritage. Uh, uh, brothers and sisters, do you have any of those? Yes, I, I'm the second oldest out of eight. <gasps> Big yes. family's all over the Big place. family. <laughs> My little brother's birthday is actually today, so happy birthday, Tim. But yeah, right. I'm the second Tell oldest. Tell him, is he going to see this show? He probably <laughs> will. <laughs> happy birthday, Hasuni. <laughs> 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 yeah, it's his birthday today. How oh, cool. Yeah. And uh, do you have a religion or did you have one? Yes, I'm, uh, I'm practicing. Muslim, and mm -hmm. I was born and raised um, as a Muslim and uh, been part of the community, and it's a faith that really means a lot to me. Of course. Yeah. It works for you. Definitely. It's it comes. When people talk about their religious persuasion, sometimes uh, a person will conjure up an idea of an extremist version of that uh, particular religion, but most religions, I think, are not that extremist in their views. And yeah. all that kind of stuff. So. I mean, there's always mm -hmm. an extremist in every religion, and there's always something called stereotypes that oftentimes brainwash people to think about the truth and understand other people's perspective and, and look through their lenses. So it's, it's really hard mm -hmm. sometimes to see what's going on in our world and the different stereotypes people have about different groups. But it's, it's a very peaceful religion, and, um, you know, as actions speak louder than word, and as a person, I always try to be a good person to people so they can the truth. I've heard the term mm -hmm. used, walk the talk. Definitely. <laughs> yes. That's and I work at it every day to get better at it. That's yeah. what it's all about. Mm -hmm. It offers mm -hmm. me such deep satisfaction. Mm -hmm. And at my age, you look for things that give you deep satisfaction. I was born in 1928, you know. Wow. I'm 86 in December. Yeah. Wow, yeah. you look really nice. I do even say age. <laughs> 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 yeah. so uh, you're finished with your education, or are you going to go back to school some more? Yeah, I'm hoping to go back and, and get my master's in environmental management um, sometime next year. I don't have a specific plan yet, but I'm, I'm doing, I actually graduated last June um, from mm -hmm. Portland State University. New graduate? Yeah. So. It's I've been in okay. school all my life. I'm still a student at PCC. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it never ends. Never stop learning. Never learn. stop learning. Yeah, I love PCC. Yeah. Yeah. For that. So widespread in its, yeah. in its, in what it, all the things it offers. I, it's incredible. It's beautiful to keep us going. Yeah, so many different majors. You just want to learn all of them and everything. <laughs> yeah, but obviously They're also, you can't do that. Yeah. <laughs> I agree. Also yeah. fascinating. Um, how do you earn a living nowadays? Do you have a job? Yes, I I work for Ground of Portland. It's a nonprofit organization here in Portland. And Say that again, Ground for? Ground, ground or Portland. Uh-huh, Ground um, or Portland. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. and um, I, it's actually funny because I used to volunteer with Ground or Portland. It's a nonprofit organization that does environmental work and environmental justice around the community, raising the community's voice and incorporating their vision into projects that's happening in communities. Um, we're doing the Portland Harbor now, and I can tell you a little bit more about it later. But sure. I. Um, yeah, I used to volunteer for what we have called the Green Team. They're actually youth students who are like environmental stewardship. Mm -hmm. And I, I volunteered with them and I left to Africa, uh, Rwanda, to go do an internship um, with my professor. And when I came back, I emailed Cassie, who is now my manager, and I said, hey, is there an opportunity available? And she said, yes, we have opening, and that's how I got my recent job. So mm -hmm. uh, volunteer always works. <laughs> do you have more than one language now? Do, I, yeah, I, I do. I speak Somali and um, Arabic. Whoa! Mm, my. Wonderful. Most Americans can barely do something with English. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I'm trying not to lose it. <laughs> Practicing oh, it. Yeah. Mm. 
So what I was going to ask you, do you have a partner, boyfriend, girlfriend, husband, um, wife, or one of those? Oh, I should let my mom answer this because according to my culture, I passed my deadline. <laughs> <laughs> my mom would be like, where's my grandkids? But no, <laughs> I don't. <laughs> uh -huh. yeah. Are you available or not? Um, yeah. No. <laughs> he said, wait. Um, I, I'm, yes, I am. Not. There's your camera, Joey. Three. Yeah, she's really <laughs> yeah, well, I'll send the application to my mother first. <laughs> yeah. Good idea. <laughs> I like that. Yeah. <laughs> and do you have a different politi political persuasion than your compatriots here? Are you no, a right? I'm, I'm, I'm a definitely a Democrat. Yeah. Memberships in political, social, or civic organizations, any of those memberships that you have. I have a list of about 30 of them through the years. And mm. Some of them I still support, like the ACLU, for example. Yeah. Any memberships that you care to mention? Um, there's uh, different organizations. I support SACO. SACO um, is currently, it's a Somali um, uh, American Council in Portland. It's a, it's a new community that's working together to help the community immigrants um, living in East Portland and in Portland in general. Um, I'm part of their board and um, part of the steering committee for the climate action, the city of Portland. And there's a lot of great organizations that I support, like CIO and um, what, what's the... Ah, I used to have yeah, a director awesome. who was very right-wing and conservative, but by now if he was the director, he'd be putting his hair out. All those screaming oh, lefties out there. Yes, yes. <laughs> yeah. 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 So let's take a break now and come back and talk about the main subject of our show. Mr. E, can we take a break here? In conversations with Dr. Don. It's an ongoing series of one-hour standalone talk shows where I interview interesting people like my guests tonight, like most of you out there, about who they are. And we've done that in the first half, and then we're going to talk about uh, the title of the show, Portland Harbor Superfund, and so on. So uh, we got some prompting questions here, but I got a couple of questions of my own to start the discussion with, sort of broad base. Remember. We, uh, this show is seen all around the world because it's on the internet also. So we got to be sure we talk in terms that uh, inc include other people as best we can. Mm -hmm. uh, this isn't just uh, local here. Uh, questions were, where's the cheat sheet? What is the Portland Harbor Superfund site in Portland, Oregon? Portland Harbor Superfund site. What is that? Okay, well, it's essentially it's that section of the Willamette River between the confluence of the Willamette with the Columbia and approximately the Steel Bridge or the Broadway Bridge in downtown Portland. So it's about 11 miles or 12 miles. Mm -hmm. the, I say approximately because there's not a solid definition that EPA uses for what are the limits, but they have a study area of where they study and where they look at everything in order to figure out what needs to be cleaned up. So the, the boundary flexes a little bit at times. Yeah. And so it's that main channel of the Blamet River where much of the harbor traffic flows because yeah. harbor traffic comes into the ports here in Portland. Why does it need cleaning up? How did it get contaminated? That's been a long process over the last 150 years. The well, I like to remind everyone first that for thousands of years, the Willamette River provided food for thousands of people. It's only been recently that it has not, and that has been since the European settlement of Northwest and Portland area. There was a lot of industry that created a tremendous amount of pollution on the river. Mm 
-hmm. Over the last 50 years, a lot of work has already been done to clean up what damage had been done previously. There are still some sources of pollution going into the Willamette, but most of what we need to deal with now is this historic pollutant, uh, historic pollution that has been there sitting in the river for 50 or 70 years. And these are things like, for example, one site on the Willamette River was where DDT was manufactured. Mm -hmm. There is a large plume of DDT that got into the ground right there at the facility and has worked its way out into the river. And so, it's in the river now? Yes. yes. And so DDT oh. is still a problem even though DDT was banned in the early 1970s. Ago, yeah. Yeah. The early 70s it was banned. So that's 45, 44, almost 45 years ago yet that is still a pollutant that we need to deal with in the Willamette River. And there are other Superfund sites around the country. Yeah, there are other Superfund sites around the country. This is one of the largest and most complex sites. Mm -hmm. Most of the time when a Superfund site is designated, there will be a very specific area where there was one source of pollutant and there's that one pollution that needs to be de dealt with. Sure. This is a site where there have been a variety of industries and a variety of pollutants and several of them that need to be dealt with. Mm -hmm. The number of industries involved is up to 160 or so. Mm -hmm. wow. As EPA has identified 160 potentially responsible parties. Now that's people that the EPA identified or Industry owners at the EPA identified. Hmm? EPA, well, like yeah, the, the Environmental Protection, protection Agency. Agency. Mm -hmm. uh, I always abbreviate it EPA, but of the Environmental we'll Protec U.S. Yeah. Environmental <laughs> Protection Agency identified over 160 individual entities, businesses, some government agencies that may be responsible for different aspects of cleaning up the river. They're not all going to be responsible because when they do the identification, they try to look for anyone who has property along the river or has had property and has had industrial development there along the river. So not all of them mm. will be responsible and, have, and will have to put in uh, any kind of contribution towards the cleanup but a number of them will be. You think you'll eventually clean up this this uh, Rabbit River in this area? Well, there will be eventually, there will be cleanup work done. How clean it gets is still up in the air because there's there are a lot of factors about how it will be cleaned up and what will actually be done. Some of it may end up staying there. We What's hope your as hunch? Much, we, we hope as much gets cleaned up as can be. <laughs> I'm pressuring you, how much do you think will be done, to what extent will it be cleaned up, and how long will it take? 20, 30 years? It could be 20, 30 years. Yeah. 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 Or longer. Mm-hmm. There, there will be, well, there's really, there's, there's a couple different phases here, because there's the first phase, which we've been up in up to this point, has been the research phase, and that's been determining what the pollutions are, what the pollutants are, where they're at, who put them there. So there will be, there's the study phase starting with, and what are the risks? The risk fact, risk analysis is a major part of it because there's human health risk assessment and biological, ecological risk assessment. Those look at what pollutants are there, where they're at, and what the risk is from them being there. You know, you guys have permission to jump in mm -hmm. and yeah. say it's full of yeah. bologna or something. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but maybe it's it's a very complex yeah. and, and, and a really interesting mm -hmm. topic, and so to understand it from the basic requires a lot of technical wordings and technical understanding, but then yeah. we are gonna, we're looking at it from also community's perspective mm -hmm. and, and and Jim does a great job kind of breaking it down, but it's 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 been a super fun site for the past 14 years, listed in 2000, um, Environment Protection Agency designated as a super fun site in 2000, and it took mm -hmm. this long, and we're still trying to figure out, at least EPA and the Lower Willamette Group, which are consisted of the 
a potential responsible party, um, the city of Portland being one of the potential responsible party, the Port of Portland, mm -hmm. our come on. And the Willamette dumps into the Columbia. Right. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, uh, just to be sure. There's the also the Multnomah know. Channel, which is you have Savi Island and the the main main stem of the Willamette River goes directly to the Columbia and then Multnomah Channel which goes around Savi Island eventually flows into the Columbia River as well. But what we find when you're studying the hydraulics of it, a lot of the flow of the Willamette tends to go through the Multnomah Channel. Uh -huh. so that's also an area of affected by the contaminant. Yeah. Are we still adding contaminants to that area? No, there's. I think most of the well, contaminants have been pretty well controlled. Yeah, there are still some sources. Go ahead, yeah, Jackie. Now we have um, what's called an NPDES permit, which is uh, overseen by uh, the Natural. Department of Environmental Quality and um, EPA. Really, Environmental Protection Agency really has oversight on them, and that limits. Um, how much industrial waste or contamination that can actually be dumped in the river. Um, the, some of the industrialists won a kind of a coup a couple of years ago uh, about having mixing zones. Instead mm -hmm. of measuring the concentration at the end of the pipe, you measure how it flowed out, say, five or ten feet. And how much it was diluted. And that means, mm -hmm. yes, in, instead of measuring the concentrated effort, uh, you get to measure the mixed. And, you know, it's, it's kind of sad because um, the industrials have some real power in our legislature, and that's what happens. Some mm -hmm. real power? Yeah. <laughs> Lots. I mean, right. that, that yeah. is in itself, you know, was a real uh, deficit, I think, for mm -hmm. the environment. Yeah. And one thing that's tended to happen over the years as well is when there have been polluters violating the law, there has not been funding for DEQ to enforce the law. Mm -hmm. So right. you get into these situations where some, when someone at the Department of Environmental Quality may actually take steps to enforce a law, and then the legislature at various times in the past, not in the last couple sessions, but in previous sessions, legislators would then adopt something with an amendment on the budget for DEQ saying you can't enforce that. <laughs> yeah, you know, if all else fails, cut their budget. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of sad because um, one of the things that the DEQ's done for the Superfund is they have been in charge of the upland or the source control, that which is on the land. Yes. And it's their responsibility to cut those contaminations flowing into the river. And they really, for the amount of money and resources that they have, they've done a bang up job. There's uh, Arco's got a wall that's very helpful. Arkema's got a processing plant that's doing lots. Arkema was a super fun site in itself. It had hexavalent chromium, it had DDT, it had uh, perchlorate, which is jet fuel. I mean, they just had an assortment of nasty things. Arco is the petroleum? No, Arkema. Oh, there's two Arkema. sites in Jackie Yeah, Arco, Arco was, is BP Arco, um, is a petroleum site, mm -hmm. and they did build a seawall there to prevent more flowing into the w river. But they've also, Arkema is the complicated, a very complicated, very concentrated site that has had just an array of chemicals. Where'd that name come from, Arkema? I never heard of it before. Well, it's it's also, it originally was called Adolfino. Mm -hmm. It and was also called... Prior to that, it was Penwalt. And Penwalt, prior to that, it was right. Pennsylvania Salt. Pennsylvania. And so there's a corporation the, involved. A number, right. of the, a number of the ah. residents of Portland may remember it as Penwalt, because I know that some people, the, some individuals that I've talked to, neighbors and, and friends I've talked to, actually worked there when it was called Penwalt. And so uh -huh. some people may recognize it by that name. But it's the same site. It's Penwalt, Adafina Chemical, Arkema. And that was where DDT was manufactured. It seems, I've heard that there's some politicians running for public office. Occasionally I hear about them wanting to abolish the EPA. 
Have you heard about those politicians? Mm -mm. Mm -hmm. huh? No, I've heard about the politicians. I guess the ones I care about are the ones that want to reenact the Superfund. See, the Superfund mm -hmm. is almost a misnomer now because there's no longer a trust fund, mm -hmm. and it really is a you know, sort of a, a euphemism for the site. And really, that's all it means. But uh, both Earl Blumenauer and a fellow named McDermott is trying to reenact. These are politicians. Yes, mm -hmm. these are legislators. Legislators. They're okay. trying to reenact the super fund, actual fund, where we t uh, t engaged or took money from uh, the petrochemical companies, yeah. both the uh, mm -hmm. chemical companies and the petroleum companies because they were making windfall profits, as we m well remember, at least I do. You're a little young. <laughs> <laughs> I read about it. And, <laughs> and there, it could be millions of dollars. In fact, I'm just amazed at like the 160 companies that are on the hook for cleaning up the Portland Harbor Superfund. Don't go after Monsanto and some of the oil companies and say, yes, you should pay up. Monsanto, when they made polychlorinated biphenyls or what are affectionately called PCBs, they lied through their teeth about, you know, whether it killed fish or not. Yes, it killed fish, but they didn't show that to anybody. Mm -hmm. And they were in denial for 40 or 50 years whether PCBs were really a negative to humans, uh, animals, um, to anything it came in contact with. And they should pay up and pay up again. In fact, I think these companies that have the Superfund sites, Hudson River is, is, is another PCB site. And those companies- That's that, from back east? Yeah, Hudson, Hudson yeah. yeah, it's in New York. Um, the Passaic, the Fox, they should actually those companies that are on the hook for cleaning them up should actually go after the chemical companies and the and the petroleum companies. The other thing we have in our river are called PAHs, or poly aromatic hydrocar hydrocarbons. hydrocarbons. Yeah. Spit it out, kid. <laughs> <laughs> and it's mostly tar, a big, huge tar body outside of Gasco, where they were. Uh, uh, using is it using coke to make well it was a site where natural gas was manufactured originally it was manufactured from coal and then it was also manufactured from petroleum mm -hmm. and apparently it was when it was manufactured from the oil was when it really created the the mess yeah and there's a huge tar body right outside what's called we call it gas go to just for short but it's it belongs to northwest natural and they're just pouring over yeah. trying to figure out how to get rid and, of and it and where is this located geographically um gas go about I mean, mile the site where the contamination is, is probably it, mile in, five in or six area? oh yes right okay. in the middle of the 11.8 miles that's part of the so do you take the do you take the the freeway across the bridge, yeah. Willamette. So when you see that Willamette River site is where the historical, they're giving you a little bit more history of understanding where those contaminants came from. Mm -hmm. That's a river that we kind of overlooked that's in the middle in the hearts of our city that's currently a Superfund site, high, one of the uh, largest contam um, Superfund site in, in Portland and it's currently being utilized by communities. Um, not a lot of people know about the contaminants and so our hope as a community members from a community organization is first to raise awareness and second to kind of give people the understanding of, of where the historical contaminant that this mm -hmm. had, had been in for a long time. These PCBs and, and, and um, DTTs were long-term contaminants that had been and are sitting on the sediment, sediment of, the, of the Willamette River. And so now the question is, what can we do as a community to move forward in accomplishing the goal of having a clean river as like Oregon, of course, prides itself for being a sustainable city? We just, um, that's where where that kind of goes into and in understanding more. Are we doing uh, all that can be done right now to accelerate this process of cleaning up the site? Uh, Are we as a society doing all that can be done? I mean, well, I don't think there's enough information out there and there's not enough information out there that is broad enough. 
for the most part, it's the PRPs or the po uh, potential responsible parties that have given the information when they first brought out what's called the feasibility study. It's a section of the Superfund process, and they they delicately brought out their ideas of what methods of cleanup we should have. And one of the problems with it is that they don't want to do anything. Their, one of their main methods that they're suggesting in the feasibility study is called monitored natural recovery. And it natural literally- Natural recovery from a contamination? <laughs> it literally means watch the river flow by and don't do anything but test it. Mm -hmm. And the sad part about that is most of these chemicals like PCBs and PAHs, dioxins and furons, they, they are literally not water soluble. So moving them is like, well, it's sort of pretending. I mean, it, it, it if it was going to be gone, it'd be I gone, can, I mean, from 150 yeah. years ago. Yeah, I can expand on this a little bit. The, the way <coughs> the me. monitored, the way natural recovery works is there are three components to it. There is what I would call the actual natural recovery, which is when the contaminant chemical that's a toxic chemical breaks down and becomes non-toxic. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. That is an extremely slow process in the event of these oh chemicals God, we're dealing yeah. with here. Uh, these are persistent. Me, to, to give a little bit of background on that, what we have in the, in the river, there were two different kind of broad categories mm -hmm. of contaminants to start with. There were the organic contaminants, contaminants that affected the water column itself and would be things like sewage <coughs> overflow. Yeah. Those, were, those are the types of contaminants that once you control the source, it breaks down very quickly sure. and goes away so that you then have a clean system once you've controlled the source. Yes. Then there are the chemical contaminants, which are what we're dealing with now. The chemical contaminants tend to be persistent chemicals mm -hmm. where it will stay there and not break down. So you have these things that have been there for 50 or 70 or 100 years and they're still there because it's not breaking down over time. Uh -huh. That's one aspect of natural recovery. Uh -huh. The second aspect is what I call monitored natural removal, which is where cl clean sediment comes in, the dirty sediment is washed out downriver somewhere. It's still in the river system. It's just somewhere else. Yeah, just, <laughs> it's not really okay. removed, so that's yeah. a little bit <laughs> it's moved. Yeah, it's just moved. It's moved, and, like it's so moved towards the that Columbia. Is, that is or one aspect down the of channel. what happens with the monitored natural recovery process. And that's not a very good one, not a good one, because if it's, especially these, many of these chemicals are bioaccumulative. Mm -hmm. So since they're bioaccumulative, when the critters in the bottom of the river eat it, they accumulate it then the fish eat it, they accumulate it into their tissues, we then the we eat the fish, we accumulate it, okay? So that's one aspect. Then the third aspect of monitored natural recovery is what I call monitored natural covering. And that's where new sediment comes in over the top of the contaminated sediment. Then you have a clean bottom of the river, but you still have contaminant under the bottom of the river. Cabin. That is what they rely on most heavily for what they're proposing in the cleanup plan. Yeah, it's an the, isolation the method. The problem is that once something else happens to stir up the bottom of the river, that contaminant gets back up into the river water column again. Like big ships turning, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But the and ROD is not up until 2017, so we won't know which of those methods that will be used within um, Fidel so mentioned ROD, that's Record, record of Decision. Of decision. Oh. 2000. And who gives the Record of Decision? The Environmental, Environmental. Protection Agency. Now, mm -hmm. How does this administration feel about the EPA? It seems to me as a, as a conservative, a mm. progressive uh, consideration of the problems associated with, with this contamination. It seems uh, I've heard somewhere that the right-wingers or the extreme right are interested in making money first right. and letting <laughs> contamination take care of itself. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. It's cheaper, mm -hmm. which is why not natural monitored recovery or natural monitored um, 
Monitored natural recovery. Monitored natural <laughs> recovery is favored, is because it's one of the least expensive. There are other methods mm -hmm. they're suggesting, and they are mm -hmm. they're suggesting capping, and capping is where you. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Concrete. like McCormick and Baxter, it was a big creosote plant, and they dug up 32 acres of creosote, creosote. and sand Ugh. and hauled it off to Arlington. And then they brought in clean sand and put over the top of that, along with, um, they call it a geotextile cover, which is kind of plastic <laughs> webbing with big cinder blocks on it <laughs> and then the sand went over that where is arlington arlington is on the other side of the dells going up the columbia river yeah it's in in, uh, in oregon yeah it's in oregon okay. mm -hmm. yeah it's not my favorite choice simply because i mean it's kind of nimbyism we're moving it from here to there and the same way with monitored natural recovery or er, monitored natural monitored natural <laughs> Recovery. Recovery is that it's just moving it and not really getting decontaminating. There are mm -hmm. some progressive methods. Mm -hmm. I will mention a couple. One is biotech restorations. They literally take the mm -hmm. sediment out of the ground, spread it out, put these um, bioremediation critters on it, and they decontaminate it. How about the, 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 the minerals like lead and cadmium? The uh, only thing is, no critters it, will take care of that. It no won't critters. Break down heavy metals, no, no, no heavy metals. No, that's the only thing yeah. it doesn't work on is heavy metals. There's another one. It's called biogenesis, and it was used by the EPA in New York, New Jersey Harbor. And what it is is a, a breakdown process of PCBs, but it also does the others. It does PAHs. It does dioxins and furans. It actually does heavy metals, and they send it through their processing and can come out with a product at the end that is benign. So this can be cleaned up? Yeah. Yes, it so literally this, yeah. can, but the mm -hmm. problem Just, with it is the cost. Uh, how come we don't have all the money yeah. we need? Not cheap. How come we don't have the money we need to clean it up? Because um, we haven't put it back, the Superfund back in, in, in back in the legislature. We who, need to put the actual Superfund. Who, who hasn't put it back in the legislature? The legislators. So it's congressional. Uh, it's congressional, federal. yeah, federal. federal. And yeah. Why, why hasn't the federal uh, done that? Well, because it's like anything. The people with money don't want it that ah, way. That's what I'm looking for. <laughs> yeah, they don't do want it. All the, mm -hmm. the companies and corporations that have all the money want to keep it. Yeah. And so we're, we're running out of time. Okay. What does a citizen we need to do to accelerate this process and be feel confident that we're doing all that's reasonable to do right now to clean up these sites? Well, one. And there's, um, I mean, this is a really big, complicated topic and it has a lot of scientific um, background to it that confuses a lot of people and gives a lot of people the fatigue because it's so complicated to understand and so then the question becomes is how do we communicate this to the people like anyone in this room like you anyone who is not really familiar with the Willamette River and then what's going on with the contaminants uh, there are some little preliminary work that has been done to clean up but it's not as where we want it to be and um, there is the record of decision that's coming out in 2016 and that determines what will happen in the future of the Willamette River that means that the community that live in Portland really need to get a, a very clear understanding and clear education to in order for them to come to public comments. How do we educate the community so with what you're talking about? We have a we you have got, a you got thirty seconds. Thirty seconds. We have Portland uh, Harbor Community Coalition as well as the Portland mm -hmm. CAG advisory mm -hmm. group. The Portland Harbor Community Coalition is a collective of um of or, of communities that are directly impacted by the contaminants, communities that are living near the site. For example, Will houses they have communities any influence? Ha yes we, they will have an influence when we come together as, as a collective voice for the time when we're given um, the opportunity to speak on behalf of the Willamette River, which is when the record of decision and EPA will have a six-month um, period 
Environment Protection Agency will have a six month comment period. Mm -hmm. And that six month comment period is when communities need to come and give their perspective on the Willamette River and, 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 and their you will um, no, I'm hopefully. Getting, I'm getting nervous because my director is going to yell at me because we're talking too long. Yes. Okay. <laughs> so one website to make sure people know about it, uh, is Portland look Harbor at the camera and tell, tell the viewers out there what they need to know in okay. the last 30 seconds or so before they shut us down. The website is portlandharborcag.info and that has some basic information about the Superfund site as well as information about meetings that are coming up and other events. For example, there's an event this Saturday at the City of Portland Water Pollution Lab, BES, which is next to the St. John's Bridge, about Willamette Speaks, which is uh, uh, talking stories about the Willamette River and people's experiences there. Info is on portlandharborcag.info. Okay, anybody else got about 20 seconds or so to say something, or 30 seconds, anything more? We have water, water is a valuable source to Oregon, a very precious one, and a lot of times we take it for granted. And I think if you look at, there are 10 cities, 10 national cities running out of water, and if we clean ours up, then we'll have the water and we'll also attract manufacturing, corporations, jobs. We just need to clean up our river. We have one, yes. one more event coming up in September 9th called Two Rivers, One City um, in conjunction mm -hmm. with Columbia Riverkeeper where our hope is to educate the community about what's going on with the Lamar. This is a really great opportunity for people to come and learn more about what's going on and, and how they can take actions and, and, and like you said, Water is an important aspect and is a scarcity, and hopefully, okay, <laughs> I'm running out of time. <laughs> Mr. Yes. Director, you're going to yell at me in a minute. And I, I want to tell you about a few public service announcements that are really important to me. The American Civil Liberties Union support the ACLU. Without the ACLU, our civil liberties would be further down the tubes than mm -hmm. they are right now. Mm -hmm. And we got to end corporate personhood to reverse that Citizen United decision, go to move to amend.org and learn how we can take what's required to turn that decision around and say that corporations are not persons and money is not speech. Uh, the Alliance for Democracy, a great organization that's local and, nation, nation, and nationwide that's very active in those kinds of things we're talking about right now. And oh, remember KFC, I gotta remind you about that. Not Kentucky Fried Chicken, <laughs> Dr. Don's KFC. <laughs> yeah. Kind, uh, friendly, and charitable. Be kind. Be friendly and be charitable to you too. And you too. And you Thank too. You. <laughs> Thank you for having us. Thank you so much. Yeah, that was fabulous. Yeah.